Good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to tonight's meeting on Young Street North. Uh, my name is Marcus O'Brien Fair. I am Councillor Fillion's Chief of Staff, and I will be moderating tonight's discussion as we go over some of the uh, the proposed plans for that part of our community. Uh, with us tonight are two panelists that will help to answer questions and present information to all of you joining us this evening. Uh, first, our Toronto City Councillor for Ward 18 Willowdale, John Fillion. And also with us tonight, uh, our Manager for Community Planning with the City of Toronto, Guy Matthew. Uh, thank you both for being with us this evening. Uh, on the back end with us tonight is also Carol Kim, who will be assisting me in doing some of the Q&A uh, later on in the uh, conversation. And Catherine LeBlanc-Miller, uh, also part of uh, the Councillor's staff. Catherine handles um, most of the developments and, and planning applications that come through our office. Uh, before we go further, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on, even if it's virtually, is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto was covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. As we get started, we want to touch on what this meeting is about. Why are we here tonight? Uh, over the last several years, the City of Toronto has held several community consultation meetings as it's developing a new official plan in the area around Young Street, north of Cummer Avenue. An official plan is a set of rules the City uses to assess development proposals. And these policies are extremely important to guiding the future of a neighbourhood but we know they also can be a little bit complicated and difficult to follow in one sitting, especially if you're not familiar with how planning works in the province of Ontario. So John has organized this meeting just to provide a little bit of additional background and detail for residents that may have not had a chance to fully participate in meetings that have happened up until this point, uh, wish to get caught up on what's being discussed, or to better understand how this planning process works and how it might impact the community. Uh, this meeting is not intended to replace the formal city meeting, which will take place on April 20th. But again, it's an additional opportunity for you to more fully understand what is being proposed. Uh, so when we have opportunities for you all to officially comment on the record will be April 20th, and it will be those comments that will feed in to an eventual council decision on this proposal. A few more housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, I will be asking several questions of our panelists to help flesh out this proposal as we go through the conversation. And a final note for all of you that this session is being recorded so that it can be accessed by those who may not have been able to participate in this evening. And uh, John, is there anything that you would like to lead off with tonight in terms of, of thoughts or comments as we get started? Well, just first of all, thank people for coming out as Marcus uh, mentioned this is not the formal consultation meeting we have had um, a lot of those over the last five six seven years um, but they uh, they are always very heavy on presentation and um, um, not always the same people coming to them and this is such an important issue it affects uh, certainly everybody who lives up in the north end of willowdale and uh, i just wanted to have a kind of less formal meeting to just make sure that everybody understands um, what is being proposed and um, that will make you better able to participate in the official meeting and uh, submit any comments or um, any anything else you'd like to say to us about it. It is not always um, an easy uh, process to follow for those who aren't used to following planning issues and um, unfortunately up in the north end of, um, of Willowdale, certainly from um, Willowdale Avenue West, there um, are no um, neighborhood associations. So when we were going through all of this further south some years ago, several decades ago, there were uh, very active neighborhood associations which got very involved and Typically, they would have uh, two or three people who would develop expertise and uh, pass that on to the other residents. So 
Um, unfortunately, we don't have that up here. So kind of another reason why we uh, just want to make sure you have a, a clear understanding of, uh, of the process we're going through here and how it might uh, impact you uh, where you live or close to where you live. All right. Thanks for that, John. Uh, Guy, is there anything that, that you want to start with off the top before we, we start getting into questions? No, oh, I'd, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming as well. And I, I appreciate the invitation from uh, Councillor Filling to, to be here tonight to try and uh, answer any questions that you or uh, your residents might have. So happy to be here. Terrific. Thanks, Guy. Well, certainly this is uh, a big proposal. There's a lot to to unpack and, and digest and um, to figure out as we move through everything. Um, why don't we start just from the bare basics? Um, what is an official plan? Can we talk about that for a moment um, and, and how that uh, is relevant to the conversation tonight? I think I'll let Guy start with it, that and then I'll I'll add another comment or so. Sure. So the official plan is a is a policy document adopted by City Council, um, and it's a the official plan is a is a citywide document that guides how growth happens across the city, um, and it's a creature of provincial policy um, and provincial legislation in the Planning Act. Uh, it the Planning Act essentially tells municipalities to create these documents. Um, that talk about guiding, guiding where growth should be, but not just growth. Where should jobs be? Uh, employment. Where should your industry be? Um, and policies around all sorts of things like that: parks and open spaces, community services and facilities. And then the way the city's official plan is structured, we then have what are called secondary plans, uh, which is what's being contemplated for this area. And a secondary plan is essentially a, a subset, so specific to a certain area, although it's a fairly large area, and then creating specific uh, policies and guidelines to guide growth um, and intensification to that area. But in the same vein as the city, as the citywide document, um, not just talking about where you can intensify, but talking about uh, public realm, talking about infrastructure, talking about the natural environment, um, housing, affordable housing, kind of all the elements that try and make up uh, a city and, and how do you how do you do a growth and intensification in a way uh, that fits within that what's existing there, supports it, improves it, uh, and builds upon, upon its character. Um, so it's taking all the different elements and trying to wrap it up and it's, and it's, it's not minute detail. It's, um, bigger picture, um, let's call it a mile in the sky. It's not a million miles in the sky because it is specific to a certain area, but it's not down to minutia, down to centimeters and, and that sort of thing. It's bigger picture items, uh, that then informs development applications as they get filed where you get into the nitty gritty one meter, 30 centimeters and whatnot. So uh, without getting too uh, technical, basically there's a hierarchy of planning uh, orders. Uh, so the, the province comes out with some policy statements and the city then must have an official plan that conforms to those. Then uh, we have rezoning. So. People sometimes who aren't familiar with this confuse the official plan and the rezoning. Um, basically, the once something is approved in the official plan, then it is easy to get a rezoning that uh, conforms to it. And uh, so sometimes people um, think, oh, I'll get involved whenever somebody is proposing a big building at the end of my street. But by that stage, you're at the rezoning stage. And um, if the building that they're proposing conforms to the city's official plan, the city really has no choice but to approve it. Um, and people, you know, again, often don't know to get involved uh, early on. So um, again, the part of the reason for this meeting, uh, Catherine, if you wanna put up a map of the, um, 
study area, just the redevelopment area, I guess, just so people are familiar with the boundaries of what we looked at. Okay, so there there we have the area. And uh, so just to recap, there are, there are several phases that would happen, you know, as a development uh, or development would happen in a community. We're, we're at the uh, sort of the master plan stage uh, with the, the, the development of a secondary plan, which is part of the official plan. At some future state, you know, assuming that this gets approved by council, then you get into the rezoning applications of individual sites and proposals. Do I do I have that right? That's right. And and just so you know, we're we're not confusing things. Um, there have been um, some rezoning applications that have already come in along this corridor. Is that is that correct? Yes, and official plan amendments as well. Okay, so can you talk that that through for a moment? I mean, how does that work when we are dealing with the master plan that hasn't been approved yet, but there are already, um, you know, other, you know, sort of later stages that are happening seemingly simultaneously? Yeah, and it's a problem, frankly, we were hoping to get this um, official plan um, for this area done um, much sooner. And the reason you want to do it sooner is you want to get out ahead of the development applications. Basically, by um, the precedent in Ontario planning law, um, you have to make a change before somebody puts in an application. So, um, unfortunately, we've had a bit of a reverse where we have lots of applications that have been in before we could get an official plan finalized. Um, so that is backwards, but that's what we um, what we have to um, live with. Okay, and I think there may be some some questions about some of those applications as we go through later on this evening. Uh, in particular, the Center Point site uh, has generated a lot of interest in some of the preliminary questions that we've we've taken, and I'm sure uh, piqued the curiosity of, of many of, of the people who are on on the session with us tonight. Um, but what has triggered this? I mean, what why is the city doing this now? Um, what has caused this this process to get underway in the first place? I'll try answering and then we'll I'll see if Guy wants to add to it. But um, again, even if there, the, the main impetus for this has been a subway station for sure at Steeles, and there was a subway station planned for Cummer. It looks like that has been cancelled, although that it hasn't those words haven't been used by the province, but it looks like it is not happening. But those two subway stations were the impetus to uh, develop a secondary plan for the area, both because the city wants to guide growth and because the province uh, requires us to. Um, so that would be the main reason. But even if we didn't have a subway, there would be development pressures along Young Street and um, we need to develop a um, plan to deal with those just because it is such a main street. Guy, anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, that was a good answer. <laughs> All right. And, and so to follow up on that, what has happened prior to this discussion tonight? How many consultation meetings have been had before now? Uh, there's a big one coming up on April 20th that, that we've discussed, um, but but what has happened as we've gotten up to this point? I'm thinking um, five, six, seven guy had eight. Do you have an eight. OK, even more than I thought. Yeah, there's okay. been eight overall. Um, now, the study takes back to 2013, so we're talking over a few years, but I would say recently since 2020, I think we've had three and this and, and coming up would be the fourth uh, as far as community consultations go. The last one being, um, I think, March of last year. And it, would all residents inside the study area have been getting regular notices in the mail as those have come up? What's the city's method in, in terms of notification? Uh, yeah, we've used the consistent uh, notification area. Um, so anybody would have been notified that way, or if they'd signed in uh, at one of the previous meetings, um, then they would have been notified as well. Unfortunately, that means some people may get two notices, 
um, but it makes sure that everybody gets notified who's interested. Okay. In in the last several years, I think there has been an increasing um, concern about housing affordability. Um, people increasingly concerned, trying to figure out where they're going to find a place to live. Um, has that played into the the timeline here at all? Is that is that a factor? I I'm um, going to say not really, but. Guy, you may have a different take. Uh, no, I was going to say, I was going to say no. Um, it, it will certainly the intensification is going to bring more housing, uh, but that's one of the things when we talk about creating policy. That's one of the things that the policies will try and address is how do you bring affordable housing as part of the housing stock um, and trying to address affordable housing. Now, affordable housing. The term affordable housing means different things to different people. Um, affordable housing to a lot of people is, can I afford a house? Um, whereas when we talk about affordable housing in the uh, policy sense, it's very specific to, to um, certain income levels and that sort of thing in, in specific housing in them. So it doesn't mean it's just cheaper, regular market units. Ultimately, most of the housing here will be guided by whatever the market dictates, whether it's rental or ownership. Okay. Do do we have a a sense, Guy, of you know what the projected growth is in the city over the next twenty years? Um, I mean, I, I think that that would be part of the, um, the the contemplation of the official plan is anticipating. That population growth and, and how to address it is that is that accurate? Uh, we have a projection for the city as a whole. I couldn't tell you what it was. Um, projected out to twenty thirty one. I think our expectation for this area, I think, is in the neighborhood of fifteen or twenty thousand. Okay. People. Although, as I say that, it sounds low. It sounds. I'm going to say, guy. I think that sounds. I want low. to say Just... forty. <laughs> Anybody for fifty? Yeah, I um, <laughs> like just Center Point Mall could easily be twenty thousand people. Just that one site. Let's we'll we'll put a pin in that one, uh, Marcus. We'll move on, and I'll give you a number in a minute. Terrific, guy. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. I mean, I think that that's probably a a big question that a lot of people living in the area currently are going to have is. Uh, how many new neighbors are we are we talking about, and and how uh, do we accommodate those new neighbors? Not only in terms of of where they're living, but um, you know what other services uh, will be required, and and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a few moments. Um, Catherine, I'm wondering if you can bring up the um, the areas of intensification map, and uh, I'm going to ask John and Guy to to speak about that. For a moment, um, you know the proposal, as I understand it, has uh, three different zones, um, which may be uh, a little bit tricky to to make out on the map there. But uh, I think you can kind of make out the center point site in the uh, the upper left, uh, colored in yellow, um, and then based on that, orient where where Young Street is, um, with uh, with Willowdale Avenue uh, bounding on the on the right hand side. Um, can either of you talk us through uh, what these three colors are, are contemplating in terms of this proposal? I'm going to let guys yeah, can, start, uh, and I'll add. Yep. I can do it. it. So the idea is that there's three types of, of redevelopment that we're anticipating. Tall buildings, um, which a lot of people would just call condos, um, and then mid-rise buildings, and then... Um, Missing middle. So around the subway station, so Young and Comer at the top, and at the bottom, sorry, Young Comer at the bottom, Young and the Steels at the top. Right now we're showing nodes at both of those areas being where the subway stations are anticipated. Now, to Councillor Fillion's point, the one at Comer uh, may get reduced based on, based on the province's decisions around that station. But in those areas, um, we would expect the tallest buildings. Um, so tall buildings, um, I think right now at Center Point Mall, the tallest proposed buildings in the 50-story range. Um, and we have some buildings in the high 20s and 30s at, at Comer. Um, and then in the, 
in the brown, uh, we would expect mid-rise buildings. Uh, mid-rise buildings uh, along Young Street itself, we'd be expecting in kind of the 12, 13, 14 story range. Uh, it would relate to the width of the right of way. So how wide is Young Street? Uh, and then as you get into the neighborhoods themselves, uh, those mid-rise would step down to, to kind of six, eight stories uh, in that range. Um, and then within the purple um, is the missing middle. Um, so that's trying to find and allow for people to provide additional housing choices, but within the same belt fabric. So we're talking about um, having a house and making it a duplex. Uh, or basement suites and that sort of thing. So adding um, subtle intensification without changing the character of the neighborhood, really. So not, so not talking about creating um, a long row of townhouses across one of those streets. It's about keeping the existing character and feel of that street and that neighborhood, but maybe adding uh, a, a second unit in the basement and, and that sort of thing. So that's kind of the three uh, differences and the hierarchy between them is kind of as you get farther away from the subway, uh, the intensification drops. All right. Um, I don't have much to add to that other than I think probably in the uh, purple area there, um, we may be looking at keeping a sort of the same house form, but but um, more units within the same building. So within you know, the same size lot as um, um, th where you would see a single family home, you might have something that kind of looks like a single family home, but it um, counting basement units could easily have um, uh, four or five units in it. Okay. And, and anticipating that there may be a few people on the call, you know, seeing their property shaded in a particular color um, at, at this particular point. Um, you know, we talked a moment ago about the master plan being being assessed and, and adopted. Um, that would have to follow with um, site by site applications. Um, what kind of timeline would you anticipate we would be looking at um, for some of these, you know, colored zones to to actually start changing dramatically? If it if it takes the same amount of time that it has in the redevelopment area to the south, um, those plans are um, thirty years old, and uh, there are still sites that haven't been developed. So you have, you know, periods where the economy is booming and your developers are buying up properties and planning to build. And then you'll have other areas where the economy is not so good. Um, immigration's down for whatever reason, and there's uh, less of a demand and things slow down. It's um, not something the city can control, but I would expect that, um, this area will get built up um, over 20 or 30 years. And that's generally life to, the lifespan of one of, our, of a secondary plan, as we expect it to build out over 20 to 30. Now, you're going to see some changes fairly quickly. Um, I mean, to your point, Marcus, we have some development applications um, that, are, that have been filed a while ago or recently been filed that obviously will result in some change sooner, uh, but 20, 25 years for full build out and full realization of the vision. It will be incremental over time. And it will happen as landowners and homeowners choose to sell or redevelop themselves. Uh, it's not the city doing the developing, so it'll be as to the council's point as developers come in and purchase land. Okay. And so an, an existing resident would, would have to be a willing participant in that. Uh, yeah, they would there's have no to expropriation. Be... There's no expropriation uh, of your house to let a developer build a condo uh, or, or anything like that. This is about the development. It's about allowing for additional opportunities on sites, and then the market will ultimately dictate when that happens. But people should be aware that um, they may not want to sell. They may not want to stay living where they're living, and nobody will force them to sell. But the 
people next door to them might sell and the people might next door to them might sell and somebody could build something next to them and um, they don't have the same protections that you would have if you lived in a what we call a stable residential neighborhood because they are in fact living in a redevelopment area so if you're in a redevelopment area you don't have to become part of a redevelopment but you're um kind of more or less not protected from it either all right um i want to get to questions from the audience in just a moment i've got a couple more topics that i i want to ask you both about before we do that um while we're having those conversations if anybody participating does have a question you want to ask again you can do that in two ways um if you would like to ask it live um you can look for the raise hand uh button on your panel either along the bottom of your panel or on the right side of your panel and uh, if you would rather do that in, in written form, you can also punch a question into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. And we will move over to that in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, before we do, I want to ask you both about um, services and infrastructure. And, you know, with this kind of uh, growth that's being contemplated, um, you know, we know this in, in, in lots of other parts of the community where, um, you know, we see strain, frankly, on, on services that we're all relying on. Um, and, and my sense is that, that for many in the community, their, uh, their biggest concern when we talk about new development is, is how is that going to impact uh, me and the services and things that I rely on. Um, I'm going to start with transportation because that's probably the big one. Uh, you know, how are we managing traffic? How are we managing uh, transit? transit, um, those sorts of things. Um, I know that there is a, a graphic that we have talking a little bit about uh, new transportation connections. So Catherine can perhaps bring that up. Um, and I will ask our, our panelists to talk for a moment about um, uh, how we're going to manage traffic um, if we are, are going to be establishing this, this new density, this new growth, uh, 20, 30, 40,000 new people uh, coming to this area. So I'll start and then um, Guy can provide more, more detail. But uh, certainly we want a lot of people taking transit, um, which is why you develop, um, you intensify more closer to um, a subway station. Um, there are some concerns about that. I'm concerned about the amount of development that will be happening north of Steeles, um, a very large amount of development. and. When the subway is extended, you're going to have um, all of those people who are already on the subway before it even hits Willowdale. So I do have some concerns about that, and maybe that'll come up in questions. Um, but um, the other area of concern, which um, I have been working with the transportation staff to address as much as possible, is to not have this area just become a funnel for traffic coming from the 905. Um, you know, we want people who live up there to come down by transit, if at all possible. We can't stop people from driving, but uh, we don't want to create these great big roads that would be cutting through the neighborhood and just uh, drawing in cars from the 905. So I have um, tried to uh, discourage that as much as possible. Um, some of these roads do go through to the other side of steels, but um, um, many of them, some of them do not, um, simply because we don't want to encourage um, a large number of cars from the 905 coming down through here. We know that from analysis of traffic on our section of Young Street, 75% of the cars now come from the 905. So um, if they are, if people are going to be driving down, and then I guess they can take Young Street and they will take some of these roads. But again, we don't want to say, come on down, get in your car and drive right down through this uh, new neighborhood. So, Guy, how much coordination is there in the city's wow. contemplation of this? master plan with what's happening in York region, you know, in the city of Markham or the city of Vaughan, what they're contemplating on, on the North side. How does that all work? Um, 
it's a it's a balancing act. So the city is doing its own study, uh, and part of our study includes a transportation master plan. So the city actually has a consultant to identify uh, connections uh, and that sort of thing. And and to the councillor's point, the connections we're looking at are not um, not about getting people through through the area faster and creating faster connections to the 401 and that sort of thing. The connections and improvements that we're looking at are about making it easier for people who live in the community to move about the community, to get to the parks, to get to the subway station, um, and that sort of thing. So we're looking for that level and creating more connectivity, but at that level uh, for local movements. As far as the the coordination between City of Toronto and then um, it's Vaughn on the west side of Young and Markham on the east side of Young, um, we're in conversations with both of those municipalities and York Region. Um, there is a secondary plan that was approved by Vaughn City Council a couple of years ago and is being dealt with at uh, the Ontario Land Tribunal this summer. So the city uh, is a party to those hearings and has been having conversations with um, the other municipalities about coordination, uh, especially when it comes to Steeles Avenue and, and what's the ultimate of Steeles Avenue. Uh, as well as conversations with Metrolinx. Metrolinx um, is obviously a big player in the game when it comes to the, the future of the subway. Um, and there's a bus station being delivered as part of Steel Station as well. So um, how does that all tie together with our vision and thinking about um, there's, a, there's a certain capacity for steels. Um, so how do we make sure that the City of Toronto, being 50% of that in, being 50% of that intersection has kind of 50% of the capacity earmarked for, for City of Toronto. Um, and that we want to make sure that our network isn't eaten up by development on the north side of Steeles. Uh, and that there's, that there's movement left for existing and future residents of Toronto as well. All right. So while on the topic of coordination, um, you know, I, I don't know how widely known it is that the, the actual subway extension, though it's a, a TTC subway line, is being championed by uh, the province of Ontario through through Metrolinx. Uh, and it's a provincial agency that is really uh, driving that project forward at, at this point. Um, I, I think there is a lot of concern coming from residents in in. in the Willowdale community about the capacity of that subway line. And if we are running it north uh, to Steeles and beyond, um, you know, and there's all this additional development that's happening along that that extension, what impact does that have on on existing ridership? Um, you know, will the, the subway system handle it? Uh, do either of you know sort of how that's being coordinated and, um, you know, what kind of advocacy is, is happening at the city level to, to address that? So I'll start, and again, Guy can jump in or uh, add anything to what I say. Um, I think I have made at least two motions, maybe three at City Council, all of which have been adopted unanimously to make sure that the province does not open this subway line um, until we have uh, greatly increased the capacity of um, of the existing Yug subway to accommodate at least all of the additional riders. Um, and that's for obvious reasons. It's already difficult to get a seat on the subway by the time you get to uh, North York Center. And, um, you know, it's we have dangerous overcrowding at, uh, at some locations like Bloor Street. So there's a lot of work that the city needs to do to increase the capacity. And um, a big part of that is the opening of the Ontario line. And um, there is a commitment from the province that this subway will not be opened before the Ontario line. Um, but I have some concerns about that because the Ontario line has not been progressing um, terribly quickly. It is a very complicated um, an expensive project. This one is expensive and somewhat complicated, but uh, far less so. Um, so I am worried that um, 
that this subway might be ready before the Ontario line and that we just couldn't, um, you know, um, accommodate all the additional riders. So certainly, um, and I have the support of the of the, the city staff on that as well as city council. So we'll be keeping a very close eye on it and monitoring it. And that, uh, um, that's about all we can do at this point. Um, right. It and and so we're we're all clear the the Ontario line is what used to be known as the relief line when it was being contemplated by the city as a uh, a way to divert ridership away from Young is that right That's correct and especially away from the um Young Bloor uh station which is a big problem bordering on unsafe Okay and and what date is uh is Metrolinx contemplating at this point uh getting a new station it steals up and running 2030. 2030. Okay. Um, I'm going to move away from transportation for a minute to touch on some other community needs um, and uh, addressing, you know, what what makes a livable neighborhood. Uh, you know, maybe the first question for you, Guy, is, um, you know, how much of that is is factored into the uh, the secondary plan process, the official plan process, this this master planning that we're doing right now, um, and then what tools do we have to make sure that the city is is following through on those plans? Um, so I'm talking about anything from new parks, new libraries, new recreation spaces, um, uh, even new schools. Um, how do we plan for those sorts of things, and then how do we end up making sure that they actually happen? So we can plan for them by putting them in policy. Um, we've we've reached out um, to our school board partners for their feedback and their input uh, to see if they would like us to identify new schools. Um, we've our parks, forestry, and recreation. Uh, staff are part of the study team in identifying the location of new parks. Um, and if it's not new parks, are there parks that need to be expanded uh, or additional uh, recreation facilities uh, to service the area? Same thing, uh, we're in touch with the, we talked to uh, Toronto Public Libraries um, and that sort of thing. So we've reached out and then in our policy documents, we can talk about uh, the need to provide those things. Um, through site-specific development applications. Um, there's uh, the Planning Act allows the city to get on-site parkland as part of development applications. So in the case of uh, a large site like Center Point Mall, uh, we would expect them to deliver a park to the city as part of their development application. Um, and we intend on doing that in the Center Point application. Um, and but the, the that policy document while is often a thought of as something that guides just developers it's actually a policy document that just guides everything uh so it's also there to guide city staff when thinking about where should we be putting a new park or a new community center we can identify uh the location for those things um so that when they go to do their work couple of years down the road or whatever, there's a there's already the work done for them saying here's the right location for it. Um, the counselor may want to add add his two cents in here, but um, what we are embarking on after this summer will be a, a bit of a new regime when it comes to how to how developers provide community services and facilities. Uh, through the elimination of section 37 agreements and moving to a community benefits charge. So Developers uh, are now essentially going to be cutting city checks um, as part of development applications based on a formula um, that the city will then have to use um, at times to create these new facilities. Um, so this policy document will be helpful in guiding uh, us in the spending of that money and, and what facility, identifying uh, where that money might be best spent to serve the community. I don't know if you had anything to add, Councillor, to that. Yeah, no, I, I do. Um, but let's start with this. I'll separate out the parks because that's, you know, um, slightly better news than the rest. Catherine, if you could put the um, that slide up. 
Um, the, the province basically left intact the provisions for developers giving parkland to the city. So we are still able to um, require them to do that. And um, I think we have a map showing um, where we're looking at parks here. So the the uh, solid um, green is existing parks. The um, green uh, stars are new parks that um, I guess have been uh, approved, um, more or less secured through development approvals, but uh, not yet uh, built. And um, those are some um, decent sized parks. So, so those areas kind of all good. Um, Center Point Mall, you'll see uh, an orange star. There's going to be a great big park there. So that's good news. Um, we think there's a big enough development site down at um, near Young and uh, uh, Drury um, to be able to get another park. The um, more difficult area is the, the large white area um, east of Young Street between Young and Willowdale. So we certainly wish to create a new park in there. We um, don't know where. Uh, we will kind of do it as the opportunity presents itself. At previous meetings, we have shown a map with um, kind of a green splotch on it that was um, intended to be conceptual. And people always say, but that's where my house is. Are you putting a park where my house is? Are you buying my house? Are you going to expropriate my house? So that's why we don't have a green splotch um, on that section of the of the map because we don't know where the park would go. But there is very obviously a need for parkland in there. So I'm feeling relatively good about the parks. Uh, schools I'm very concerned about, although that is the school board's problem, not, um, not the cities. They operate the schools and uh, they get funding from the province. So that's a problem that we can't solve, although it is um, certainly a, um, a big one. We know how overcrowded many of the schools in Willowdale are. The, um, the big concern I have is with um, other community facilities such as childcare centers. And we used to be able to get um, a lot of money from developers. Um, and in the area that I've represented um, in Willowdale, south of Finch, um, we have built a very large um, number of new child care centers uh, paid for by developers. And we've also built some community centers paid for by developers. And um, that has all worked out fairly well. However, in 2019, the province changed the rules and um, the, those new rules will take effect formally in September of this year. They have kind of informally sort of taken effect already. And uh, the amount of money we get from developers that we can use to, for example, build a childcare center is approximately 25 to 35% of what it was previously on uh, one large site that I'm working on now, it is one sixth as much. It went from 36 million to 6 million. And, um, you know, it's just so I, I do uh, I am very concerned about that in the future, how we will build, you know, the small library branches, the child care centers, um, any additional community centers we need when we add an extra uh, 50,000 people to an area. Um, you know, I am concerned about all of those things going forward and um, we frankly need a change in policy from the province in order to be able to keep up with the new population. So, John, I, I just want to challenge you for, for a moment on on sort of the the notion of things being pretty good 
south of south of Finch in that southern area. Um, you know, I, I'm a dad living in that neighborhood. Uh, you know, I've tried to get my kids into childcare. I've tried to get my kids into city swimming lessons, and you know, it, it's been near impossible. You know, e even under the old system, um, you know, I, I think that most would probably feel that you know the city's really struggled to keep up with uh spaces needed to to meet the growth that's happened there you know what you're telling us to be clear is that you know as of this summer there's going to be significantly less money made available to the city to provide those facilities than was even the case before um where we might already have thought that um we weren't keeping up is that do i have that right yeah, and I would say we're both right, Marcus. We have struggled to keep up um, with, um, you know, the examples you gave. The issue there has been how fast the growth happened, faster than anybody thought, and that's the main reason why we haven't been able to keep up. Not so much because we haven't had the money to keep up. We still have some unspent money that we're we've been holding on to till the opportunities present itself. But up north, we just won't have the money. It's just it's just going to be that simple. Okay, and and are there any other ways? You know, I I think that um, you know there have been some parts of the city where we have seen examples of of a little more creativity happening, uh, integrating some of these facilities into developments, uh, including schools, uh, certainly childcare centers and community centers and and things like that. Um, does that get contemplated at this at this phase of planning, or or is that something that happens later on? Um, I'll, I'll I'll try answering, and then it, it I may answer it. It should happen in both. I think we should, um, if we were doing this official plan really properly, you know, and had all the time in the world to do it and lots more resources, you should ideally plan out where everything is going to go in the new community before you have people start building big buildings. But because we have difficulty controlling that, we can't control what developers ask for, we can't control what approvals the Ontario Land Tribunal gives them, not the city, but the Ontario Provincially Appointed Land Tribunal. Um, so it just makes it a lot more complicated. Um, and it is pretty much impossible for the city to do anything unless the developer cooperates. So we can say, we would like you to include a child care center um, but we can't make anybody include a child care center. We can give density bonuses to locate a child care center, but we can't make people take it. Um, so it, it's just difficult. We really need um, some cooperative developers. Um, there haven't been too many of those lately, but um, we'll, we'll hope. I'm, I have some higher hopes than average for Center Point Mall. So far that applicant has um, spoken a lot about wanting a complete community with all of the, the good things that would uh, entail. So hopefully they will help us figure out how to do that and pay for it. Yeah, and just to add to that, Marcus, I mean, I think at you have to remember that this is being done without a development partner, right? This is the city creating a vision. So we can identify uh, the needs. We can identify kind of the general location that we think those needs should be located. Um, but until the developer comes along and there's a developer partner that's going to build the thing, how do you actually integrate it into a specific building? Those kind of details need to wait for, for that stage of development, so the rezoning stage. Um, but at this point, we can certainly identify what we think the needs will be, um, what services and facilities are missing, um, and we can kind of identify where we think they should be provided uh, at when they do come on board. Okay, and and my last question before we 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 move on to to stuff from the audience, 
um, you know, in a, in a similar sort of theme um, comes from commercial activity in the area. I think a lot of uh, of questions that we've seen have to do with, um, you know, what's happening at the Centerpoint site, for example. Um, you know, if a lot of the retail there is going to be lost, uh, you know, what happens to the, the grocery store in the neighborhood? Is there a way to, to replace that specifically? Does the city have a role in that? Um, and then part two is, you know, are there opportunities in this to plan for uh, perhaps a more vibrant main street? Um, you know, if we're losing the mall um, per se, you know, would there be more opportunities to create, uh, you know, retail up and down the young corridor that that would perhaps be be walkable and, um, you know, a, a nice area to to take a walk and, and find a bite to eat and, and do some shopping? So I, I'm going to try and then Guy jump in. Um, we uh, can certainly require retail at some locations on Young Street, on a main street like that. Uh, we cannot tell people, uh, we cannot tell the developers who should go into that retail. Um, so we we do have a chance to come up with a vision and try to implement it. But there are limits to that. The so the example being um, Center Point Mall, and, and I do think that the applicant there um, wants to retain a large grocery store. Um, certainly, with all the additional population, you could have two grocery stores in there. Um, and I believe that the grocery stores. Um, want to locate there uh, i believe the existing grocery store wants to stay there but we can't require any of that the city can't compel it um, so we can encourage it we can hope it happens we can expect it to happen but we can't make it happen uh, i'll guy may have um something further yeah, no, especially that's, that's that's exactly it we write the policy that says uh retail we can permit the use of a grocery store um, but ultimately, it'll be the market that dictates whether it's a grocery store or a cannabis shop or a pizza place. Um, and along Young Street, I think we would expect the same thing. Uh, there's a whole mid uh, a whole stretch that we're contemplating as being mid rise, so pedestrian friendly scaled buildings with retail at, at grade. So your coffee shop, your local little stores. Uh, we're not looking for regional draws into those those um, buildings. We're looking for the small scale stuff that so you don't need to drive to go grab a loaf of bread. Uh, you can walk to your little bakery, bakery, bakery at the end of your street um, and that sort of thing. But yeah, to the council's point, we can we can put the permissions in place, but ultimately we can't force a grocery store to go in. We can't force a specific grocery store to go in uh, at the end of the day that's going to come down to the person who owns the land the retail space and who they're going to lease it to all right thank you guys for uh for taking all of those questions so far we have more uh so don't go away just yet uh, I'm going to check with Carol first to uh, see if we have anybody in the queue with their hand up that uh, is looking to ask a question of their own. And uh, we will mix and match some of those with some of the questions that have been popping up in the Q&A box. Um, Carol, is there anybody that uh, is, is itching to ask a question? Absolutely. Um, we have Pat Walcott uh, on the line. You, can, you are unmuted. Go ahead, Pat. Thank you very much. Um, I live uh, south of the study area. I live at Young and Finch, actually. Um, so there is that gap between Finch and Cummer uh, that's not really covered by this particular study. But what I'm, what I'm really unclear about is not the policy, but what our vision is for this neighborhood in terms of walkability, uh, what, uh, what the neighborhood would look like in terms of retail, uh, in terms of being an attractive neighborhood, uh, et cetera. Because right now, frankly, it's a bit of a jumble. It doesn't seem planned at all. 
And I'm, I'm assuming that it wasn't planned, that it just sprang up. But in the future, do we have opportunities to more strongly influence what this neighborhood looks like? For example, the old Toronto Hydro Building, I'm assuming that there is an application approved or under review at the moment. And for people like me in the neighborhood, we are not totally aware of what this area is going to look like, what Center Point Mall is going to look like, which is really the only grocery store that we have left because now we have a huge uh, complex on the other side that has taken over food basics, for example. So I'm kind of hoping for uh, this neighborhood to look more like Shepherd and Young, uh, where we've seen development that has been growing and um, is starting to look like a walkable neighborhood. So could you cover some of that, what our vision is for the whole area, including that gap area? So that's a really, really good question um, because what you're talking about is livability and which is really the most important thing we can do. Um, we know there's going to be a lot of big buildings that the province requires that good planning sort of dictates that um, Young Street is a major street, but how's it going to feel? What's it going to look like? What does it feel like if you're living in it? What does it feel like if you're living, um, you know, a few hundred uh, meters away? Will you? Is it? Will it be an area you want that you want to walk out to? And um, certainly, I I can tell you my vision, and I think it is kind of coincides with the the cities that that we want complete communities. We want um, places where you, you know, you, we want you to live in close proximity to where you do your shopping without having to get into a car where you'll, um, you know, meet a friend for, for lunch or a cup of coffee. We want uh, a main street that isn't a highway, you know, that has fewer lanes of traffic, cars not just speeding through to get from, a to B, we want uh, places for people to ride bicycles and, um, you know, we want to have enough schools and childcare centers and uh, recreation centers. And um, uh, we really want all of those things. Um, the, um, so that's what the city wants. The city can't control a lot of things because the city, unfortunately, does not have the final say in either the official plan or in any rezonings. And you mentioned 5,800, the hydro site. So that's a really unfortunate example where we were, you know, hoping to work with the owner um, to, you know, kind of create, a, um, you know, make that part of a vibrant new community. And uh, they have appealed to the Ontario land tribunal um and um it uh, will in all likelihood be the ontario land tribunal that makes the decisions about what happens with that site not the city we can try to steer things a certain way but again unfortunately we don't have the final say so yes we have a vision the vision probably um is similar to what yours would be um but um, we can't control whether we fully get there or not. Yeah, I mean, that's a great answer, Councillor. Um, I guess just for, for and I'm sorry I missed your name, but um, if you want the details on that site, you can just Google Staff Report 5800 Young. That's the address of the hydro building. Um, and you can get the details on that one. But it's we are we're looking for a pedestrian friendly and that's why when i was talking about roads i was talking about creating these more pedestrian friendly blocks and connectivity and letting people move through their neighborhood better and more efficiently and we're looking at how do we increase um how do we get new parks but how do we also improve the existing ones on that parks map you'll note that they were it was talking about expanding goulding park um so how do we do that and we're looking, the vision is that the highest density goes where the subway is. 
uh, with the highest towers, and then and then there's mid-rise along Young Street. And so mid-rise buildings um, are designed, including angular planes at the front, and the whole purpose behind that is to allow sunshine onto the onto the sidewalks. So you've got Young Street that's got a a pedestrian a, a building that's scaled to feel comfortable to pedestrian relative to the width of Young Street that's got sunlight on it. Uh, that we're expecting retail stores to be uh, on the ground floor of. Uh, retail stores can be um, like shopping, but also restaurants, um, uh, cafes, that sort of thing, corner stores. Um, so we're looking for places to the counselors um, point complete communities and complete communities to us mean you can, should be able, ideally there will be facilities there for you to work, live, shop, play and do it all and we're trying to keep you uh provide all the things you need to not have to get in your car to go places uh but to the council's point it is we can only do so much the the private development side has to come along and do its part and um obviously the market like we said is going to guide things like is there a grocery store is there are there two grocery stores um that sort of thing um but that that's very much our vision pedestrian uh scaled friendly cycling um outdoor space uh through public parks but also just outdoor space um local small scale retail uh serving daily life needs uh that you can walk to but we don't want you to have to get in your car and drive half an hour for a loaf of bread so so guy am i correct that this all of that sort of visionary stuff would also be encompassed in the city's complete streets uh, policy that's been been adopted. Uh, these are the types of things that the city is trying to do in, in, in most areas that are being redeveloped. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's fair. It's something that we're trying to achieve everywhere. I think the the benefit here is we're writing a new secondary plan to guide the growth. So we can take some of these things, um, some of these best practices that maybe be in a guideline or something, we can turn them into a little bit stronger vision through policy um, and, and try and um, really make sure it happens, get some policy enshrined in it. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Carol, I'm going to go back to you. Do we have another hand up? Uh, we don't have another hand up. Um, so I will encourage and welcome anyone who would like to share um, a comment or ask a question to our panel to please uh, click on the raise hand function. Um, we do have a number of questions asked in the Q&A. Marcus, if... Uh, I'm see yeah, I'm seeing some of those. Um, yeah. You know, I, I hope Pat's question wasn't so good that uh, we're, we're, we're scaring <laughs> off anybody else from, from putting up their hand. Uh, that was a great, a great lead off. Um, we've had a few questions coming from, uh, from Eddie in the, in the Q&A um you know from from a bit more of a, a technical perspective um you know one is asking about um sort of achieving some of the missing middle goal um goals in that particular zone um you know making sure that it's complementary to the surrounding neighborhood um he's noting the uh oriole parkway neighborhood as being a really good example of, of missing middle that blends nicely with the neighborhood um in order to achieve this uh is there any thought of subjecting such proposals to a site plan application process um, and then he's also asking, um, you know, how we might prevent bleeding of higher densities into the remaining neighborhoods. Good questions. I'm going to toss it over to Guy. <laughs> because, <laughs> Give me the hard because ones, it's right? a, Well, it's a more technical uh, <laughs> answer. Uh, no, the, there are some really good questions. Um, the one on the site plan control, I mean, the city's policy right now and the way our, our site plan control bylaw uh, is is lined up is they likely wouldn't be subject to site plan control um, but the and, and for those of you who are, aren't familiar with site plan control it's kind of the last stage of approvals when it comes to large development so it really gets into the nitty-gritty thing about like building materials uh, it gets down to uh, in your landscaping what type of shrubs is it um, and make and securing that what type of tree are you planting um, but the idea, um, it's an interesting one, but the idea behind missing middle is that it, is that it should be easy to achieve for landowners and not so onerous. 
um, that it drives them to do the more intense redevelopment. Um, so by not being so prescriptive there and just letting an, uh, an owner put in a basement suite or take their uh, two-story house and turn it into a duplex, um, it will continue to just feel like the duplex or the, the detached house that's there now um, and but at the same time provide additional housing for for another family um, so I don't know that we would want to get that prescriptive through site plan control um, in in that instance um, I think it may actually detract a little bit from the attractiveness of doing it uh, because as soon as you start to jump through more loopholes, it will become less attractive to to a small home buyer and become uh, more of a technical game that the big developers get involved in. And then you're going to see lot consolidations uh, and and them pushing the boundaries on um, maybe what we're what we're thinking of. And as far as stopping stopping dense intensification going where we don't want intensification to be, uh, we will. Our policies will uh, talk about where we see these different levels of intensification. Uh, I think that the policies will be backed up by uh, solid planning rationale, urban design rationale, transportation rationale. Um, but ultimately, anybody uh, in the province can file an application to amend. So the secondary plan, there will be two years where you cannot amend it. Um, but after two years, of after a two years worth of it being approved, uh, anybody can file an application and then we'll have to defend it. And depending on provincial policy at the time uh, that, that that application is filed and, and things, um, the city may agree with them or, or under appeal, it may be approved uh, despite the city's opinions. So um, we will do our best to keep intensification where we think it's most appropriate at the scale that it's most appropriate. So uh, again, really good questions, and I because Guy, I had Guy go first so I could think of what my answers would be, um, because they're it's That's they're what not I'm here for. They're, <laughs> um, on the site plan thing, I, I think Guy makes a good point. You don't want to um, you want we want to encourage this to happen, not discourage it by you know creating more um, bureaucratic red tape. But I also uh, started thinking about what we've done with laneway houses and garden suites recently, where they are allowed um, as of right, um, but there are certain standards in order to get them approved as of right. You have to, you know, follow certain things uh, around landscaping and percentage hard surface and and all those sorts of um sorts of things um, and, and they, you know, a lot of care went into developing those standards so that people wouldn't be forced to go to committee of adjustment, uh, but also that, you know, they, they would have um, the new buildings would have not have a bad impact on what was around them. So that's a really good thought. Um, the um, and I'd invite you to talk to me more about that offline if you'd like or talk to Marcus. Um, we will be looking at um, missing middle in a much larger way. We'll be looking at multiplex housing as part of a city study that is um, ongoing and uh, may even have a report to council um, by June or July. So um, good time to be thinking about those sorts of things. As far as your second point about the um, higher density bleeding into other areas. It's a it's a really really valid concern because we can create whatever policies we want, but unfortunately we know that when developers go to the Ontario Land Tribunal saying we don't like the city's policies and rules, we want to do whatever we want, they almost invariably win to the point where I cannot remember the last hearing we won in Willowdale on an individual application. I do, it's been so long, was so long ago, I can't remember one. So it's a, that's a real re, a big concern. And, you know, we, again, we, we need the province to respect the city's planning rules and not appoint a body that just uh, ignores them. 
All right. Could uh, talk about that for, for quite a bit longer, I think, John. Um, but my understanding is that Carol has uh, uncovered a few more raised hands. So we apologize if uh, earlier we, we skipped over you. Uh, Carol, I will ask you to uh, invite our next participant to speak. We've got Natasha up next, uh, and she'll be followed by Andre, or sorry, rather, Alexand Alexander and uh, Lena. Natasha? Yes. Uh, Hi there. Hi, can, can you hear my voice? You can. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I first want to thank you for the opportunity and setting up this meeting at this time of the evening. Um, but my question is really um, stemmed from the, the past two years events, so which uh, when you guys were talking about uh, the needs of the people in the area or any area in the city, really, you talked about schools and green area and services and on so on. But uh, the past two years, especially recently, when I heard, I'm referring to what I heard on CBC radio about um, our healthcare system, and um, I, I fail to remember who, but someone who was credible mentioned that um, Ontario, in, compa in compared to Canada and even countries in our level, uh, pre-pandemic had the worst um, ratio uh, of nurse to patient. And they explained that uh, we need about uh, one nurse per four patients. And before pre-pandemic, Ontario had one to eight or 10, and now during pandemic is what's one to 30. So my question is that with the city's growth and um, increasing density and all this population coming in, and I know the housing needs and everything, I don't hear anything about, maybe there is, maybe there isn't, any about how are we adding hospitals and how are we expanding our health care because uh, all these things are very nice and rosy as long as we don't get sick. You know, we got to, you get the schools are not the city problem, school board is going to deal with it. I don't know uh, from your policy perspective, uh, where is the medical care coming in. I'm not talking about doctors, I'm talking about hospitals. So is that a province thing? Is the city working with the province? What kind of policies are we going to have in place? Because what they mentioned in all these reports that I'm following and other meetings I'm going is partly we all had to go to lockdown because the healthcare system couldn't handle it, not because the situation was actually that worse because many other countries didn't have to go through what we did. So are we doing anything? to make sure the population coming in these neighborhoods later on in the next 10, 20, 30 years that you guys are saying will not go through another thing like that and will have proper hospitals in the areas. So health healthcare is entirely the province. Um, presumably, although, you know, and, and we don't have any, I don't have any interaction with them on uh, on this issue, it's another very valid point. Um, so the the province um, requires um, the cities to um, add population, and and I don't disagree with uh, with that requirement up to a point um, that we need to increase the population. We have more people moving um, into the country and into the city. Um, they all need somewhere to live, but they need to make sure that all of the areas that they're in charge of, that there's enough of them. So um, we can't require that coordination. And I'm not even sure, you know, the extent to which it happens. Guy, maybe you know, but, um, you know, I've certainly never been contacted by anybody from um, the province or from the healthcare sector, for that matter, saying, uh, can you tell us what you think um, your area needs as far as uh, increased or improved healthcare? I don't have any experience with that either. So, yeah. big gap, a good, good question. Yeah, I think I think it's one of several, and and it's not to to shrug it off. I mean, you'd address it from the school's perspective as well. That uh, you know these are big concerns that people have, and and we rely on these services, and uh, certainly don't want to see them them crowded out. Um, you know, we we're having to to really focus our attention tonight on the the services that the city is responsible to providing. But uh, you know, it's a good question to to ask uh, our MPP as well. Is this is something that uh, they have contemplated in the 
in the the growth requirements that they've set. Um, okay, Carol, let's uh, invite our next participant. Sander, you are up next. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, I'm an existing resident of this area, Young and Steels, and this proposed development certainly uh, looks quite, sounds quite scary. But uh, could you please explain a bit more in finer detail the schedule, the main milestones? So far, I understood that the entire development will take about 20 to 25 years. That's what I understood earlier. And that the subway at Young and Steels will be built roughly by 2030, which is in about eight years. I'd like to know when will, when will we lose the mall, the shopping area, and how you will be developing it? Like, will you demolish it first? and then start shopping for like new developers or new new stores who would be in the area you will build and open a new grocery store first and then de demolishing the existing one so how will this work and well when will the mall kind of cease to exist so we we did a whole we did a whole evening on this a few weeks ago um just on center point mall because uh, so many people were asking exactly those Questions. So um, again, it's not the city that's proposing the redevelopment of Center Point Mall. It's um, the uh, owner of the property that is proposing the redevelopment of Center Point Mall, which is um, kind of to be expected because there's a subway station there, and um, so we can we are developing policies that guide them. We can't tell them when to build, whether they should uh, rebuild their site over five years or over 50 years, those are decisions they will make as a private landowner. Similarly, we can't tell them how many grocery stores they should have. Um, we have had some productive discussions with them. As I mentioned earlier, they do seem, um, and I don't say this about every applicant. In fact, I unfortunately can say it about very few, um, they do they they do mention the word community all the time. They talk about complete communities, um, and I think they do want to include um, the types of things you're talking about. Um, I, I, guy, you are probably more familiar, but I think their intention is to uh, redevelop the site over um, a long period of time and in phases, so that. Perhaps one portion would be demolished and rebuilt, and then another portion would be demolished and rebuilt. And I'll pass it over to Guy. Yeah, I mean, the short answer is we we don't know. Um, they'll do it when they think the market's right. Um, but our expectation is that it's going to happen in phases over a number of years. The, the mall's not going to be there one day and gone the next. Um, they have a number of – there's leases – uh involved uh, with their existing tenants that obviously they they will need to to meet and meet their obligations under those so um the the one part of your question that i'm going to roll with uh was you asking about kind of critical timelines and, and milestones and i'm going to take that and expand it beyond center point to the study as a whole um and just kind of give people the sense that we're we're getting towards the end of it. Like I said, there's there's been eight meetings um, since the city started this work, and and we've done three in the last kind of two years. Um, we're we're hoping that April twentieth, uh, um, that will be kind of the last consultation meeting. We're going to come out with um, draft policy for everybody to review, and then take that on to council for for adoption. So. Uh, the last city council before the election is in June, uh, and it would go to community council before that. So we're hoping uh, to make that timeline after the April community consultation meeting. Um, so that that's that's our ambition at this time, um, and then uh, that would be subject to appeal. So it may end up uh, at the Ontario Land Tribunal, um, but after that, we would expect um, development to kind of follow. Uh, the vision and thought and policies contained in that document. All right, let's go to our next hand. Thank you. We have Lena up next. 
hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity uh, to ask questions. Um, so if the Commerce subway station will be canceled, will the uh, road widening and um, of uh, La Riviere Road and uh, expropriation of properties, uh, along, some properties along La Riviere Road um, be pushed through? So I, I'm not sure that the city is planning to expropriate any properties along La Riviere. Um, um, the, um, but unfortunately, the, the, what your question about Cumber makes me think of is that we, just because there's no subway, unfortunately, doesn't mean that there isn't going to be a whole whack of big development because the province only told us very recently that there is not likely to be a subway. And um, the city's um, uh, planning rules kind of contemplated there being a subway there and developers purchased land and applied to redevelop the, the area based on there being a subway there. So although, as Guy mentioned at the outset, there may be a few properties along there that uh, don't get higher density development that haven't had uh, that haven't had approvals yet there is um, unfortunately been a whole pile of big development that has already occurred there um, in that area because um, a subway was expected so it's uh, created this uh, situation kind of the worst of all possible worlds but again, there's right. no no expropriation on the Riviere that I'm uh, aware of. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, we still have a number of questions in the box, and uh, we are, are scheduled to wrap up at, at 9. What I'm proposing is we take five minutes to just talk about um, where do we go from here, how can residents continue to be engaged in this process? Um, and then maybe if you'll both indulge me, uh, you know, we can do another final 15 minutes of questions um, before we wrap up. Is that fair? Yeah, for sure. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, so I don't know if we've got any kind of a, a slide prepped for this, Catherine, um, but I think it was sort of that big question of, um, you know, beyond this discussion tonight we've talked about the official uh meeting that the city will be hosting on april 20th uh that is a change by the way uh previously it had been been scheduled for march 21st uh so if you've seen a march 21st date uh, that is no longer accurate uh, april 20th will be the date of the official consultation the city will be doing on this and that will be the the final official consultation before recommendations go to go to council um beyond that what are the other things that that residents residents can do to be engaged on this, to, uh, you know, express concerns, to influence the outcomes? Um, well, attending a meeting like tonight is a, a really good step. And I, I will say this has been the best meeting of, um, of all the ones we've had. I think the questions have been terrific and uh, the amount of um, information that has gone out um, probably has been uh, been very good. So the main thing that I always say to residents is make sure that you understand what's being proposed. Um, secondly, kind of familiarize yourself with the planning rules, both uh, you know how much say the 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 city has, what uh, you know the context is for doing all of this, and then uh, make your suggestions, make your comments, and um, there isn't a lot of time left to do that. So anybody who's interested in doing it should kind of really apply themselves to it, uh, following up, if, whether it's reading reports or asking questions of any of us um, here tonight, um, and certainly attending the meeting next uh, month and uh, following up from there. And, and John, I mean, how much is, has this process been influenced by the fact that there is not a um, uh, a formal residence association that has been formed on either side of the street uh, in proximity to this this area? Well, it's certainly a lot harder for the city and especially for me to engage with residents because um, 
you know, I know from earlier phases of um, official plan development in in Willowdale, there was always a um, uh, some very active individuals uh, in some cases who knew planning better than I did, um, and um, you know, we were able to to have really good conversations and hammer things out, and the rest of the community would accept information that came from them and they would have their own meetings and and then get back to us with their ideas so um you know that would have been a much better way to do it unfortunately we have not had success in um creating those kinds of associations up in this area it's never too late um might be too late for involvement in the official plan but there's going to be an awful lot of rezoning applications that are going to come in that follow this and uh, it would be terrific to have some uh, neighborhood associations and um, we are always I know you are Marcus and uh, I am as well um, always wanting to encourage that and help them get started yeah absolutely and and I would say if if there are those interested in that process uh, that are on tonight um you know contact our office and and we'd be happy to have some of those uh some of those conversations um okay so we have uh looked at 15 more minutes to try to get through uh, a bunch of questions in the box um i'm going to quickly try to go through some of the the greatest hits here and and we'll do these rapid fire so let's see uh if we can get uh get you guys to be as concise as possible and we'll see how many we can work in in the next 15 minutes uh otherwise we're keeping a record of, of all of these so if you haven't had your question answered uh we will do our best to get you an answer by email uh after the meeting tonight as well um but uh Question has come up relating to impact on property taxes, um, either by you know owning a property that's in this zone, uh, or if a you know a high rise development is is built next door to you and and you're choosing not to sell, uh, you know is that likely to to impact your property tax assessment? Um, you know what would you anticipate a, a homeowner would expect in that regard? Uh, short answer over time is yes, because your property taxes are based on the value of your property. So to the extent that that you get a planning designation, which would cause someone to pay more for your property, that um, could over time affect your property taxes, not immediately, but over time, it certainly could. All right. Um... Uh, question about where else the city might consider putting a subway station if not being directed by the provincial government to locate it at uh, Steeles and Young. Uh, do either of you have any other thoughts on, on where a new subway station would be optimally located to uh, serve the the North York area? Um, well, Cummer, Cummer and Young, yes. All right. I, I think there is some thought at, at some point to extend that Ontario line even north of uh, north of Shepherd, um, and and to have that sort of going further north as well as a parallel line um, that has been contemplated, but that would be many many years down the road. Um, will there be any speed control mechanisms like speed bumps uh, going to be installed on streets? Uh, like Hilda, for example, to discourage people from speeding, especially when they're avoiding Young Street? Um, Hilda is outside of this area, so it's not covered by any of the policies in it. So, um, you know, that the situation after we adopt an official plan will be the same as it is now. It's kind of up to the um, residents of Hilda to, you know, get together, talk among themselves and, uh, and get in touch with us about uh, how we can improve the traffic situation on their street if we can. Yeah, so the the city does have a, a fairly specific policy on where where speed humps are located, and uh, a big part of that does um, have to be uh, initiated by residents that would be impacted by them. So if there is a an interest in in organizing neighbors um, in that regard, certainly contact our office, and we can can send some additional information. Um, I think this next one is more of a comment than a question, but. Um, 
uh, indicated that more indoor swimming pool capacity is desperately needed in Willowdale and, and hoping that this is something that uh, that is being considered um, as, as looking at, I guess, uh, future community center uh, expansions. Did you did you want to comment on that, or is or just? Uh, it was it was a comment more so than a question, but uh, and, it, and it's, I mean, I just say it, it's it, it's valid. Um, the same as everything else, as the population increases, we, you know, we it was great. It's great that we have Douglas Snow. Um, it was wonderful when we had that back when it was built, and the population was much smaller. Now it's. Uh, it's a lot harder for people to get their kids into programs there because there's so many other kids. Um, so, sure, we do need more facilities. That one's a big ticket item. Um, so, you know, harder, much harder to do, but uh, certainly a very valid point. All right. Um, I guess another question that you both touched on before. Um, but it is sort of, I think, an example of some of the exasperation that we we often hear in these meetings, and that is just when will this expansion stop? Already seeing additional buildings being proposed along Young Street north of Finch, way too dense for limited services that are here. What guidelines do you have in place to stop this aggressive expansion? Well, um, again, there's there's sort of two sides to this. The city does want growth. The city does want um more housing for all the people who need it, uh, who come to live in the city. So that part's all good. Um, but um, as I've said several times before, um, both I'm I can't speak for Guy, but I'm guessing he would agree. The city planning staff and the councillors you elect um, and the community, uh, you know, should have a real say in what how that all turns out and unfortunately um we don't you don't because um in the end when there's a dispute it's settled by the provincially appointed ontario land tribunal which um pretty much always sides with the developers john can you touch on for just a moment how that's changed over the last couple of years because um, you know, for anybody that hasn't been following along, there were some reforms to that system brought in by the provincial government, I believe, in 2018 that were then changed again by a new government in 2019. Um, can you touch on that at all and, and just maybe clarify sort of where we are on, on some of those provincial rules? Sure. And I'll try to do it succinctly. It's a complicated subject. But in 2018, the previous government, you know, in the in their final year in office, um, essentially got rid of the Ontario Municipal Board um, and brought in new rules which basically said that an applicant could only appeal to the provincial appeal body if they were alleging that the city wasn't following its own planning rules, that the city just didn't like them um, or some such. And there was a brief time when those rules were in place and when somebody would come in with an obnoxious application, we could just say, no, we're not approving it. And in one case on Shepherd Avenue, we actually came in with, we just wrote our own bylaw that conformed to the secondary plan. And we brought that in and approved it and said, now what are you gonna do? Because they would have had no grounds to appeal it because we passed a bylaw that conformed with the secondary plan. The current provincial government um, brought everything back the way it was and even did so retroactively. So, um, so again, we've totally lost control. The, any applicant, it doesn't matter what they propose. And we have people proposing densities that are three times as high as what, um, uh, what we allow in our, our official plan and they appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal. And the um, reason they do that is they do extremely well there. All right. Um, more of a technical question. Have the MTSAs been included in the plans for the next meeting? That's such a That's technical question. That's probably for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the guy question. 
Uh, we can show the draft policies. We can show the draft boundaries at the next uh, community consult consultation meeting. Sure. Uh, and you, if you have greater interest in uh, the MTSAs and the PMTSAs, uh, I would watch for the next agenda of Planning and Housing Committee. There should be a report. I believe the next report deals with the North York uh, locations. They've recently reported on downtown. All right. Um, question about how the recent provincial report uh, complaining that cities are making the development process too slow, um, how that will impact Toronto? Uh, I, um, is that me again? Yeah, you, you try, Guy, and then I'm mad. Uh, I mean, I assume it's talking about the housing affordability report that was recently released. Um, I mean, in short, that's a report that was written for the provincial government and the provincial government can do with it what they want. I guess we'll see what they do with it, how many of the recommendations they implement. In the short term, no, we're going to continue to process applications. Part of the reason it takes as long as it does is often because of the volume that we have in Toronto uh, and the number of development applications we see. Um, we don't intentionally slow development applications down just because we can. We we were diligent in our review and, and we have a lot of them to get through. That's it for me. Anything, anything to add? No, I, I agree. If we had more cooperative applicants who wanted to follow the planning rules, it would certainly speed up the process. All right. Um, two questions that are, are very similar um, to talk about energy efficiencies. Um, Lowering carbon footprints, uh, how to make developments more more carbon neutral. Uh, one that supposes that um, you know that may largely be a provincial role, but uh, the city has recently done a, a fair bit of work, I think, updating its building standards for energy efficiency. Uh, is that something you're up to speed on, Guy? Yeah, I mean, there's there's multiple levels there, right? A lot of building efficiency stuff has to do more with building code as opposed to. Um, uh, development approval stuff, but overall carbon footprint and that sort of stuff with any development approval, uh, we have the Toronto Green Standard, so we're looking at um, how to make um, every development that comes in greener than the last one, more energy efficient, uh, but also how do you deal with stormwater runoff, um, green roofs, cool roofs, bird-friendly guidelines. Uh, we lose millions of birds every year to running into buildings. So how do we try and deal with those impacts? So we're on top of it. Um, when it comes to building efficiencies specifically a lot, a lot of that's buried in the building code though. Yeah. So, so it's, it's something that is advancing. Uh, you know, many will have heard of the transform TO package that's that's recently gone through through council containing some of that, but it would be a, a parallel track to what we're discussing here in terms of a planning process. Yeah. That's right. And and there's some things that the city has a lot of control over. For example, we recently changed the parking standards to um to you know require developers um in certain locations, especially near subway stations, to have less parking, um, and uh, you know that uh, came largely out of an environmental concern. It also um, deals with a traffic concern. But um, the the city has had a pretty good record, not perfect, but a pretty good record on environmental issues um, in recent years. Okay. Um, a two part question here. Can you confirm that it is the city that plans, schedules and builds the infrastructure of roads and two specifically for the proposed street connection between Beecroft and La Riviere? What is the timeline for that plan and build process? The city plans roads, um, but at times we require developers to build them. Um, and then convey them to the city. We're not always technically the builders, although they would be built to our specifications. Um, and there is no timeline. Okay. Uh, do you want to touch on the, the Beecroft uh, extension at all, John, which is not necessarily the the full connection, but it is advancing? Well, it's, it's a little bit complicated at this time because um, 
we still have some properties we need to acquire. So that's kind of the main impediment to um, getting roads built is the city needs to own the land um, before a city roads can be built on them. So um, I, I think it's too big a subject to kind of get into when we're trying to be quick in the in the waning minutes of a meeting. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. So uh, the, the the asker of that question, feel free to, to send us a, a follow up note, and um, we can try to get you a little more detail on on what's happening there, because there will be multiple parts, uh, you know, in terms of how that question is is answered. Um, and uh, you know, similar sort of question, and, and possibly similar sort of answer, asking about when properties in the area get rezoned. Um, and uh, when the new street between Young and Willowdale would would get built, um, you know, if if that is in fact a street, um, any kind of contemplated timeline for for that kind of an infrastructure project, or how would that work? So first of all, on the properties getting rezoned, they don't get the city doesn't rezone them unless somebody brings in a rezoning application. So that typically or always comes from the, almost always comes from the owner of the uh, properties uh, that they want their property rezoned. So it's really hard to know when that would happen. Um, with the, um, what was the question again with the, with, with the others? Timing of that North, timing of the North, East, North South connection between Dumont and Young. Okay. I'll let you answer, answer that. Uh, guy. Um, yeah. I mean, the the short answer is it w it would come with development. Uh, we would expect it to be provided over time through development applications. So there is no real timeline. Um, the the thing with official plans is because and secondary plan policies is because they have such a long um, shelf life, kind of in the twenty twenty year range to be fully built out. Some of these things aren't going to be realized overnight. They're not going to be realized in five years. Um, there may be portions of it that get built sooner, um, but then there's other portions that, that sit around a long time. I guess the Beecroft extension uh, is is part of it, right? We've seen out portions of Beecroft get get extended, and, and then there's other pieces that we're, we're still trying to complete all these years later. Um, so it's not always the fastest process. Um, but th that though that connection is would be intended whether it's a, a street or a mid block connection, uh, so cycling and, and, and walking connection, uh, it would be expected to be delivered with through development applications, so by developers and incrementally over time. Okay, and uh, I think the last question we're going to have time for tonight is uh, other than the subway station at Steels and Young. What other assumptions is this official plan based on? For example, is this supposed to become a regional center, public transit centric, et cetera? I'll let you have that um, one, Guy. Yeah, I mean, it's it, so the study is intended to address future growth here. We're, we're expecting to see maybe more growth here than we would uh, without a subway station coming. Uh, it's also a bus station, so there will be a number of TTC and um, York Region buses coming to um, Steeles. Uh, you're going to see a number of buses that currently go to Finch now go to Steeles. So the York Region buses won't be coming as far south. Um, but is it intended to become a regional destination? No. Um, it is. We know there's a subway coming. There, we have provincial uh minimum densities to to achieve around subway stations and we're seeing the development pressures to do it so we want to make sure that it's done in a way that's sensitive uh to the current residents and creating a real community uh and built out through a vision as opposed to just ad hoc development applications as developers find land to purchase so um that's the reason for it we're not looking to to change this into some regional sort of destination by any means. Gentlemen, you have been troopers over the last uh, hour and 45 minutes as we have peppered you with questions uh, about what's going on here. Um, any final thoughts, John, before we, we wrap up tonight? 
Uh, no, just want to thank everybody again. This has been um, the best planning meeting information community meeting that I've been part of in a while. It's uh, and th these are harder to do online. I think maybe the format uh, um, has helped this time around. Um, so good, good questions, good conversations. Again, please um, um, follow up. Please come out to the meeting on uh, April 20th. Um, and um, I look forward to hearing from you further. And thank you, Guy, for giving up an evening and uh, Marcus and Catherine and Carol as well from the office. Thanks, John. And, and we do know there are still a number of questions we haven't had a chance to get to tonight. Uh, we will be following up with as many of those as we can by by email. So uh, hopefully expect to get something from from our team in the next couple of days. We will try to get every one of those questions answered. And again, there will be more opportunity to engage on on April 20th um, and, and glad to have had the opportunity tonight to perhaps uh, answer some of those questions um, proactively before that session. Uh, hoping you're all a little bit more more armed with information going into that public consultation uh, in a few weeks time. So thanks, John, for setting this up. And, and again, Guy, for being with us to the whole team. And of course, thanks to the community for coming out in such numbers tonight. It's been uh, always great to, to see that level of engagement um, because that's what really helps shape our neighborhoods and, and make them great places to live. So thanks to everybody for being with us. Uh, keep in touch and we will see you again next time. Have a great night.